Hey, good morning, everyone. Happy Tuesday morning. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning as we dive into the scripture. And uh, I, I look forward to this every morning. Uh, I get the opportunity to just uh, dive into the scripture and look at the, the Word of God as it speaks to us and encourages us. And uh, we're going to continue our uh, discussions today on these prison letters that Paul writes to the churches and the believers in the first century as he just encourages them and the steps of faith that they are taking. Um, I think it's I think it's vital and important to remember that <clears throat> when Paul and any of the writers in the New Testament, particularly, are writing these letters and these words of uh, uh, discipleship, these words of uh, mentorship. Uh, these are young believers. I mean, we're talking about people that have only, I mean, the, the church is only around 30 years old when Paul is writing some of these letters. Uh, so it's not like there's a, a whole long history here with the church and things of that nature. So many of these people are just really infants in their walk with Christ. Uh, new believers come in all the time. And so, so we, we see that Paul often reminds us uh, of certain things that maybe sometimes we would think maybe are elementary and like why is he spending so much time on this but gotta remember this is so new to them that he has to make sure that people understand right that they there's a foundational level that has to be uh, built there uh, so that so that God can work upon, uh, on top of that so uh, so some of the things we read are like yeah I've, I've heard that before but I love how Paul talks about some of these things and how he hits on these things and says something really interesting here in this text today. We're in the book of Colossians as he writes from Rome. Paul is in jail in Rome and he's writing to the Christians in Colossae. Um, I, I love what he says in chapter 2, verse 6. I mean, we could just read really all of it, but let me hit a couple things here. He says, uh, so then just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, Strengthened in faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Thankfulness. I love that idea that we are in him, that we're rooted in him, that we are growing in him, that we're connected in him. Uh, this is echoed in Jesus' words, right? In, in John chapter 15, Jesus says, um, uh, I am the vine, you are the branches. Uh, Jesus is saying, I'm the vine, I'm the trunk, I'm the stalk. You guys are, as people and individuals and churches, <clears throat> <clears throat> excuse me, are the branches, he says, apart from me, you can do nothing, right? We only produce good things. We only produce faithfulness and righteousness and kindness and joy when we're rooted in him. And that's what we've been talking about on Sunday all along for the last couple of weeks. And so I just think that's important that we recognize that. It talks about not being deceived by the things of the world. And then he gets into chapter 2, verse 9, uh, through the next couple of chapters or verses, and he says some really important things he says for in christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form that's the idea that in christ he was fully god and fully man right that all the fullness of god dwelt in him we looked at this yesterday that jesus is the exact representation of the father uh and in christ verse 10 you have been brought to fullness he is the head over every power and authority in him there's that phrase again you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. This is a, a, a neat particular part of Scripture. I love how Paul writes here. So Paul's writing and um, in Colossae, there were Gentiles, but there were also many Jews as well. And so he's got a mixed bag of, of people who were in the uh, audience who were listening to this letter as it's read um, and being taught. Um, but whether you were a Jew or whether you were a Gentile, you understood, people understood fully the idea of circumcision, right? Circumcision <clears throat> was something that God had ordained in the Old Testament as an identifying marker for the Jewish people, that they were to be circumcised, the male, male children were to be circumcised. Um, um, if you don't know what circumcision is, you can Google that. I'm not going to talk about that uh, here on our uh, video this morning. Uh, 
but we recognize that circumcision was a was a um, a physical thing that was done, uh, right? It required a cutting off, right? Uh, a separation from something on our body. Um, this dynamic was something that was performed by someone else. Um, you, you didn't do that to yourself. Uh, let me just say that without going into any more detail on that. Um, it was something that was done to you, right? And so Paul uses this illustration saying, you guys know about circumcision, right? That it was a human thing that, that a, a doctor would do that, especially in our culture today, a doctor would do that. Um, parents would have that done for them, right? For, the, for their children. Um, but he says in verse 11, he says, in Jesus, you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. So Paul's saying, I'm using this kind of play on words here, this idea that you guys know what physical circumcision is, but I'm talking about spiritual. I'm talking about that, that you were circumcised in Jesus, right? He goes on to say this, he says, your whole body or your whole self ruled by flesh was put off, or we could say was cut off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism. Uh, this was the identifying marker for the believers in the first century, that those who were baptized in Christ were, were new creations. They had been made new. The old was gone. That's what the Bible says in Romans 6. The old was gone. The new has come, right? There was a cutting off of that addiction and sin, that old way of life. The old way was gone. The new has come. Uh, Jesus is, or Paul is saying here, you guys need to recognize that, that, that there has been something spiritually, um, a, a spiritual surgery that has taken place where you have had your sin removed, your old ways removed, your addiction, those chains uh, that bondage to sin has been removed from you. Uh, I love how it says that circumcision was done to you. Not that you didn't do it yourself, right? We don't do that ourselves. We don't get rid of our sin on our own. It has been done for us through Jesus. I just think that's so important. He goes on and talks about how this happened in verse 13. He says, You are dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So many words in there that are just powerful words to remind yourself. It says that God made you alive. Right? You didn't make yourself alive. He made you alive through his grace and through his mercy. It says he forgave all of our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. Legal indebtedness meant we legally had such a debt that we could not pay it. Our legal indebtedness meant that it was our own fault, that legally we were in debt because of our sin. That I chose a sin, you chose a sin, we stepped into that, and there was a legal um, uh, side to that that made us accountable for what we had done. Notice that it was God who took that away for us. It says he, he took it, took it away, um, it stood against us, condemned us, but he took it away, nailing it to the cross, right? That through the cross, Jesus took our indebtedness, that through the cross, Jesus took our wrath and our payment for sin, that our suffering and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I just, I think that's important that we recognize that dynamic of what has gone on at the cross. Um, it says that Jesus nailed those things to the cross. So when they were nailing Jesus to the cross, really it was our sin that was being nailed to the cross. Jesus took our sin on himself. Jesus bore the weight of the suffering of our uh, of our sin and our shame and our death that we had. Um, so that means all of our lies that we've told, all of our lustful thoughts, all of the dirty things that we've said, all the impure actions, all that stuff, right? We have put on Jesus. He took all of that for us, nailing it to the cross. And it says in verse 15 that he disarmed the powers and authorities. Um, 
making a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. That in the cross, he defeated the work and the power of Satan. That Satan no longer has the advantage over us, right? Greater is he, he who is in us than the one who is in the world. Uh, we no longer are under the oppression of Satan and his reign. He cannot control us anymore because we have been set free by Christ. I just love that. It says triumphing over them by the cross. When we look at the cross uh, from a surface level, um, when we look at the cross from a physical level, we think, man, that was a horrible thing. But in actuality, in actuality, it was a beautiful thing. Um, I love how God takes what was intended for harm and do something good out of that. That took place in the book of uh, Genesis. Uh, the brothers of Joseph sold him into slavery and had all kind of problems. Eventually, it ended up leading Joseph to Egypt, where he was going to end up coming up with a plan to save the world through famine. Um, and Joseph, when he engages with his brother 17 or 13 years later, uh, he says that what, what um, Satan intended for harm, God has used for good. And the cross, Satan thought that was a weapon to destroy Jesus, but actually it was what brought us life. And I just love that picture we see in the scripture. So be reminded of that. Be encouraged by that, right? Your salvation is not based on you. It's based on what Jesus has done. Your victory over sin is not based on your merit or what you've done. It's based on the circumcision that Jesus gives us because of his gift at the cross. So just remind yourself of that and be encouraged and thank God for those things. And let's do that right now. God, thank you for giving us, uh, uh, first of all, a life with you, a relationship with you where we know you and walk with you and you strengthen us. Lord, help us to be uh, aware that we don't deserve any of what we have, that our legal standing should be that we're still in debt, that we're still owing you um, for our sin. But you have taken that away. You nailed it to the cross. You've given us freedom. And, uh, and you've given us victory over sin and over death and over the power of addiction. And uh, you've done that through Christ. So help us to trust in you and be confident the God that the promise is true, that greater is the one who is in us than the one who is in the world. So we lean on that and we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us. Hope you guys were encouraged by that today. We'll jump back in tomorrow morning and look at our next section in the book of Colossians. All right, God bless. See you soon.